Yeah, uh, I'm in a group called, uh, tw I think it's called 20 Books to 50K on Facebook. And uh, oh. it's basically a self-publishing group. I've been self-publishing books since before there was print on demand. I, I actually printed mm -hmm. a, created a print book and was selling it in Barnes and Nobles. This is 30 years ago. So I've wow. been on the, on the self-publishing train forever. Um, and, but I've never made a lot of money at it, just a little here and there. These are people that basically figured out how to make lots of money self-publishing books. And what they do is they mm -hmm. write 40 or 50 books a year. And, you know, they, they, they're all in a series and people buy them because they're interested in their books. And I'm like beating myself up because I'm not going to do that. I could, mm -hmm. I have the writing skills to write these books. And I used to tell my wife, but they're bad books. And she got all mad at me. Says they're not bad books. And she's right. They're not because mm -hmm. nobody's going to read a bad book. What they are is good books, but <laughs> I don't want to write good books. I want to write great books. I have yeah. to write books that I think are the best I can do. And that takes time. You know, that's me going back and combing it again and again and again, you know, and that's where I can't do what those people do. And so that that's the difficulty I'm finding I'm always in. I really right. care about what I'm putting out. There. Oh, you said it just as I was thinking it. I was in my head. I was like, it's the caring. And then you said care. Um, yeah, sometimes caring too much can be a, a hindrance yeah. that some of these people, even let's say real estate developers, they're just like, fuck it, build a bunch of houses, just, you know, make them the minimum to code and get them done, get them sold. Those yeah. people will make a lot of money. Whereas somebody's just like, I want to make the most beautiful house. It's like, all right, well, you might make it for $2 million and sell it for $1 million. Yeah. Um, lose a ton of money, but boy, you made a beautiful house. Uh, right. And then it's tough finding that intersection to be the the frank lloyd wright that makes beautiful houses that people are willing to pay a mint for uh and um but yeah i know what you mean. A, a dear friend of mine also one of my best friends is a one of those kindle book writers yeah that just she's a she's a young woman from romania oh god dude classic you know you talked about the privilege earlier she and i talk about this exact thing uh she grew up in like fucking nothing in Romania and like abusive dad, alcoholic mom. She left home at 13, walked across the border to Hungary and found a nunnery that would take her in and let her live there for free because she basically had no uh, valid parents and then saved her money, like put herself through school. And at the age of 19, realized she could write Kindle books. She met somebody that was like making a million dollars selling Kindle books, even though he had no, uh, business doing so you know what i mean like he was no genius but right. he just figured out the formula on how to do the amazon advertising and see what people are looking for so she met this guy they dated for a while he showed her the ropes and uh she's just made a million dollars now uh, she just showed me her uh her bank statement i mean not her bank her uh, amazon royalty statement yeah, yeah, yeah. showing her collected that and i was like whoa a million dollars i was like dude you're making way more money than me and then i saw that it's like number of books 75 i was like wow you've written 75 books yeah uh and it's amazing and she's you know 29 mm -hmm. something yeah, yeah. like that and, and it just cranks them out and has a system using amazon ads to see what people are searching for and um by the way i should say all this in past tense now that she's made a million dollars, she's uh, she's focusing entirely on a long fiction work that she's really excited about. That's making no money at all, but yeah. she's got enough savings, you know. That's what my um, grandma always told me I needed to do. She's like, you can write whatever you want after you've made some money. Right, right. But then, no, it it is the struggle, though, isn't it? But it's yeah. there are some. You mentioned Paul Simon earlier. Paul Simon tried to make the best album he could with Graceland. And it worked and people recognized that it was a great album and a ton of people bought it. And there are many things like that. I mean, there's there's so much precedent. I mean, come on. So much precedent for people who make something great and that's why it sells well. Mm -hmm. um, great the movies. Opposite, the opposite is so true. Do you know a band called okay. Producers? Have you ever heard of the Producers? No. That's the sad thing. Okay. I'm going to tell you that without a doubt, the Producers' first album is one of the finest records ever created it's just a beautiful piece of 80s pop it's flawless it's better than anything the cars ever put. wait a minute wait a minute the 80s pop producers hold on this is sounding more familiar can you tell me anything more that would ring a bell about them tom Wehrman produced them 
And uh, the, they had a few hits like What's He Got That I Ain't Got. Um, What's he got that I ain't got? This is sounding more familiar now. Wow. So, I mean, I found these people because I interviewed Tom Wehrman and uh, okay. interviewed him several times. And, you know, he, cool. uh, he, he describes the producers as the saddest thing in his life because basically this is a band that they, they just had it all. This, this band produced this beautiful first record and a really good second record, but then they fell in the cracks in the industry. And um, yeah. I've gone on a bender and just listened to hundreds and hundreds of records by hundreds of artists. And I would say that, you know, 80% of them are really good. And some of them are top notch mm -hmm. and you've never heard of them. And it's, yeah. it's, it's a killer, you know, it's a, it's a killer. So imagine this, I'm 20 years old. I just graduated Berkeley College of Music. I moved to New York City ready to be a successful musician <laughs> and I get a job at the entry level, uh, tape room guy at Warner Chapel music publishing, which the main office was in LA. So the New York city office was in, um, right there in Rockefeller center. Um, and it was just like 13 people. And so the music library in New York was this huge room with every piece of music that Warner Chapel music publishing owned. And that was my room. I was the guy that was my room. Um, and so anybody needed anything, any piece of music, a copy of anything, I, they got it from me. Any new music came in, well, all the new music that came in every week went to me to, for archiving. And so, dude, I saw thousands of brilliant albums that were not just brilliant, but like they got signed. <laughs> like they had the record release party. They had the celebration party that they got signed to Atlantic Records or Warner or whatever. And there was the album and not just the album, thousands of these albums that I'd never heard of. And I was, you know, very well versed in the world of music. I'd never heard of these people. And there was one in particular, it was actually um, Wendy and Lisa, who yeah. used to be with Prince's band, right. made a great record around 1990 called Eroica, E-R-O-I-C-A. I loved that record. Genius, a brilliant arrangements, great songwriting. And like nobody bought it. You know, same thing. Um, and then every now and then it would happen. Check this out. I remember in hold on, yeah, 1991, I was working at Warner Chapel Music Publishing, and two new artists came our way. They had done video demos. One was these three. Uh, girls from Atlanta that were doing like, like a hip hop group. And they had like th these three loud personalities. Like one was over the top, crazy, kooky. One was doing the sexy thing and uh, the little, uh, and one was just doing the like hard ass thing. And I was like, oh man, this is great. They've got so much personality. This is wonderful. Everybody at Warner Chapel was like, nah, no, don't hear it. <laughs> nah, not a hit. So that was TLC. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, and then I was like, see, I knew they had something. And then the other one was this piano player with this giant raging red hair doing these like, little sensitive songs on piano, these weird poetic lyrics. And again, like Warner Chapel, the, the other people in my office were like, nah, don't hear it, pass. And that was Tori Amos. Oh, uh, yeah. So it was nice to see that every now and then, like somebody that sometimes you can recognize something brilliant and the world does respond to it but other times you see some or you hear something wonderful and brilliant and the world does not respond to it and it's just like nah. Eh, well tori amos knows. worked way like you find out when you look at some of these people just like how many years sometimes decades before yeah you know I, like with bruce springsteen i always thought for him it all began with his first record but he was <laughs> touring you know and all up and down the east coast with a band for 10 15 years before that yeah you know um, yeah. and tori amos also the same thing like two or three albums before that you know these people kill themselves to to get that chance and if they're lucky they get it um, yeah and, and there is some luck involved and it's heartbreaking you know maybe it's just that the thing you're talking about your main mission now is the um the serenity prayer <laughs> the, the things yeah. that I can control and affect the, and the things that I can't and the wisdom to know the difference that it's yes. yes sometimes like how the world perceives you is just out of your control it can be yeah. timing luck um but on the other hand it can also be crafted that I think there can be an art to crafting 
a public persona. And I think some postmodern, can we, do we call them that? Artists like uh, Andy Warhol, David Bowie, even Miles Davis, uh, crafted their public persona as part of their art. They were yes, not just absolutely. natural. They weren't just being who they were. Right. Uh, they crafted the way that they came across to the world as part of their art. It's like the frame around the painting or it's the presentation. Um, that's what I love about Brian Eno. Brian Eno talks about this shit. Um, if you find... Actually, you know what you might like? I, I never really promote it much. But it's just a free thing I made back in 1999. Musicthoughts.com. So okay. M-U-S-I-C-T-H-O-U-G-H-T-S dot com. Still there, yeah. Is a free website that I put as a collection of all of the most inspiring quotes uh, I had ever heard about music. And a lot of them were from Brian Eno. He was the main <laughs> inspiration. That I read a lot of Brian Eno interviews. And he gets really wonderfully philosophical about music and art. And um, how the way that you present your art to the world is part of the art that he said yes. like, mm, I see. just imagine a painting that is at the bottom of uh, a river and the only way you can see it is to put on a snorkel and a mask and go down there that's an artistic statement that is not just the same painting that's hanging on a brick wall yeah. um so yeah how you present your art to the world is part of the art and it sounds like that's the big challenge for you now is to focus on that more meta level of how you're presenting yourself to the world. So that it's almost to find out what's the disconnect here. Why am I working so hard on things that be, why am I valuing this so much more than other people are, or how can I get them to see it in such a light that they value it as much as I do? I agree. Um, and of course there's a piece of that where you involve other people. Uh, I, um, Got, well, I'm going to see Adam Ant, if you can believe that, in just about uh, three or four weeks. And I didn't, I liked, you know, his two or three hits, but when I realized he was coming to town and that he's made a big comeback and that he was bipolar and he's made a big recovery, I'm like, I need to learn about him. So I listened to all his albums, watched a bunch of interviews with him. Fascinating, wow. fascinating guy. Um, wow. Here's a guy that he, he really had the stuff to do whatever he wanted, but his bipolar was such a weight that it really dragged him down. It really made it impossible so all the manic energy that allowed him to do everything also the the depressive energy stopped him and got wow. him into trouble but um he was you know he he said in an interview that he got a, to hang out with michael jackson and he asked michael jackson you know because he was he was trying to do the same thing as michael jackson craft this really amazing image dance you know all this and he said to michael how do you do it and michael said i only work with the best so mm. simple but if you think about Michael Jackson, yeah, right, that's it. You know, he just worked with the best. Um, he didn't craft that image himself. He had the best people in the world doing that for him. And you don't see those people, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know who Bowie had working for him. Maybe Bowie did that himself. He could have. He's, he's got that kind of brain. Uh, but um, most of these people have people doing that for them, you know, because they can't, mm -hmm. they can't see themselves. Can you forgive me for bringing up Springsteen again? <laughs> um, I've, I think I've mentioned this in a couple of interviews. Springsteen was with Terry Gross on Fresh Air. And Terry Gross asked him, you know, what is it like to have be up on stage and people want to be that guy up on stage? And Springsteen said, a lot of times I wanted to be that guy. You know, and then I was like, oh, that's nice. not him as a person. This thing he's created is a thing that yeah. he's created and he's got people helping him create that you know and i don't take that for granted anymore you know but mm. i'm not going to spend fifty thousand dollars to hire somebody to do that for me right now no but it is there's a we can get started ourselves yeah yeah you can get started i could get started myself on this separation between authenticity and consideration um well put. Thank you. <laughs> uh, authenticity. A lot of people think it's important to just be who you are naturally, but I think in a way that's inconsiderate because <laughs> that's not what the audience wants. No, right. Um, right. I learned this with my first 
gig with the circus where um, when I was 18 years old, the circus hired me uh, to be a musician in the circus. But it was a small little circus. It was basically a performing troupe of like six people that would go around New England. Um, so they said, uh, the previous musician just quit and we'd like you to uh, do the gig. And so I was just thrilled to get this job as a musician. But then after a week or two, they said, hey, so the previous musician used to go out the, at the beginning and sing the theme song and kind of get everybody in their seats and welcome them. And could you do this? And I said, yeah, of course. And they, all right, the previous musician used to close the show with a big dancing number with this and get everybody up and jumping around. Could you do that? I said, okay, sure. Um, and this is like, you know, one week at a time, they were adding these responsibilities. And then they said, so the previous musician used to go out in between every act and kind of like get everybody ready for the next act and introduce it. And eventually it became clear that I'm the ringleader. I'm the MC. Uh, if you were to come see the show, it was you would have thought it was my circus. And um, I was 18 years old and I was being authentic. <laughs> and I was terrible because you don't put an authentic eight year old in charge of a circus that people are there to be entertained. And so the uh, my boss at the circus just kept pushing me like, no, be more sensational. Because I'd go up there like, hey, everybody. So, uh, yeah, everybody, you know, get in your seats and guess we're going to begin pretty uh, soon. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, uh, cool. All right. Well, show's going to start soon. <laughs> Sit down. You know, and that was me being authentic. Right. Um, and they said, no, no, no. Like, come on, just be more sensational. So finally, after a few weeks of them saying this, I went out angry. <laughs> I was like, I'll show them. I'm going to go so over the top that I'm going to ridicule their request. And I, I went out with just this cheesy persona. Ladies and gentlemen, what you're about to see is the most amazing. You know, you know, we are going to have it. And the elephants are going to be coming out dancing. Maybe look above your side because you might see a parachute with the snakes coming out. And the Mayan Circus is about to be in three minutes. Take your seats now. And I went backstage like, there. Is that <laughs> what you wanted? And they were like, yes, finally, thank you. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> you actually want me to do that? They're like, yes, that was it. You nailed it. Oh, my God, that was great. So, yeah, for the next 10 years, I was the ringleader MC oh. of this circus where I put on that persona. So that didn't and... disgust you. You got it and you, you did it. Oh, yeah. I mean, because then you real. it's all just a silly game, right. you know. And uh, I think that anybody in entertainment has to kind of see that delineation between their true self and like putting on the monkey suit, you know, for the, uh, cause that's what the audience needs. I wonder that with those things like the Oscars, you know, like, wouldn't it be hard to not laugh at yourself if you were dressed up, if you were at the Oscars and you had to dress up in the fancy thing and then stand there like this and that as they took your pictures on the red carpet. Yeah. It's like, I would just be like, Oh, just, never mind. I'll just skip the whole thing. But no, that's part of the job. You just go do it. You play the part. You act like a movie star for 10 seconds of the photos and then you move on. It's part of the gig. Was that um, your first lesson in useful but not true? Ooh. I don't know. Maybe. I feel like useful not true is a theme in between what I've been saying and thinking for years. Um You've seen me post things in the past, like even 10 years ago, I would say things like um, men, and w men and women are the same. Uh, I'm going to assume that men and women are the same. I say, I know they're not the same, but believing it helps counteract my bias of assuming that men and women are more different than they are. Mm -hmm. So to help counterbalance my bias, I'm going to assume that men and women are the same. And there's always somebody in the comments or the emails that replies like, but that's not true. They're not the same. They're different. I'm like, I don't care that it's not true. I'm choosing to believe it because it's useful for me. Yeah. Not, not because it's true. Like we don't choose our beliefs because they're true. Cause what's objectively true anyway? Like I said, okay, I clap my hands. That's true. Everything else that people can tell you, you know, murder is bad. Uh, it's important to be loyal to your country. Um, this person, this, public figure is a bad person and that public figure is a good person. None of it's true. It's all just a, a perspective. It's a viewpoint. Um, 
I don't believe in, you know, nothing of the mind is true. So anyway, yeah, I choose beliefs because they're, because of the effect it has on my actions. Going back to what we said much earlier, it's like, I just think there's no point in beliefs unless they affect your actions. So when you were saying that it's frustrating to have all these people saying like, hey, man, you just need a better mindset. Uh, that it's, that's, it's pointless unless it turns into the actually better actions. How does this work into this? When you have, I'm sure you've experienced this, uh, people lying to you because, or maybe they don't think they're lying, but they're, they're telling you that they're going to do something that you need. Um, yeah, I'm going to come see your show, and they're not going to come see your show. That's neither useful nor true, or is it? Is it useful in any way? Here's my take on it. I lived in New York City for 10 years, and then I moved to L.A., and I remember everybody in New York telling me how fake people in L.A. were. So I moved to L.A. during the peak of CD Baby. It was 2002, and CD Baby was toast of the town. It was a great time for me to move there. But I got a crash course in flaky L.A. culture. And here's my take on it. Is, um, when somebody tells you that they're going to be at your show, they mean it. They absolutely optimistically think that they will be there. They're like, yeah, sounds great. All right, Thursday night, 8 o'clock, see you then. Cool. They actually, in that moment, it's sincere. They really think they'll be there. Yeah. And then in the eight days <laughs> leading up to it, they get other people asking them to do things. And then it's Thursday. They sit in traffic for an hour. They get home at 6.30. And they see this thing that says, go to Adam's show at eight. And they're like, Ugh. <laughs> I'm tired. And they're just like, uh, maybe he won't notice. <laughs> and so they, they flake, but they weren't lying. I think they're just the most optimistic people on earth. I think that America is an optimistic country and California is the most optimistic uh, part of the country. And, um, so I, it, that's why I encountered so many people optimistically saying they would be there to help you, saying they'd show up at your show, saying, saying they're going to buy your thing or whatever, saying they're going to introduce you to this person. Right. And then it never happens. They're not lying. They, they really just uh, were optimistic, too optimistic. Well, I, I would assume it's useful to them to be optimistic. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, hell, for a, a town that, uh, an industry town like that that thrives on its uh, creative output... Yeah, it's back to that belief when you're making something, when you're working hard to create something, it really helps to have a belief that people are going to like it. If you didn't believe that, you probably just wouldn't stick it out to do anything or make it great. You have to believe that people are going to like it. So yeah, it's it's uh, optimism is necessary. Oh, I see, I see. Because everybody over there is a creator. Everybody's selling something. So even though they're responding to you, they're, it's that optimistic mindset in them. That's interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. I'm glad you told me that. Uh, that gives me a little compassion for, for these people. It's, it's really that, helpful. That's how I explained it to my New York friends. They were like, how could you move there? Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, look, you got to understand. Here's, once I got to know them, I realized that. Um, yeah. But then, you know, I had to explain to my L.A. friends why New York people are so harsh. <laughs> I'm like, no, they think they're doing you a favor by telling you the raw truth. It's a bonding thing. They're not being, they want to show you that they're a real friend by not being fake and saying, great, you're selling donut holes. Sounds like a great idea. It's like, no, that's a shitty idea. A friend of mine tried to sell donut holes. It, it bombed. You're going to lose a ton of money. Don't do it. It's a stupid idea. Nobody's going to like it. They're trying to help you by saying this. They're like, yeah, but they're just they're just killing my buzz, man. I just want to be excited about this thing. And they're just shooting it down. I'm like, yeah, that's, they believe they're doing the right thing. Yeah. I, I, the way I heard it expressed was uh, New Yorkers are uh, kind but not nice. And Californians mm. are nice, nice but not kind. Reverse. Yeah, I think it's, wasn't it the opposite of that? No, because you're being kind when you're telling somebody the truth. Oh, okay. Interesting. Oh, nice is the is the surface. Right. Kind is the under the surface. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just lost all my New York subscribers, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think it's I think it's really healthy. Do you remember that there was that uh, song called Wear Sunscreen? 
Oh yeah. It was, it was like a, Absolutely. it was supposed to be like Kurt Vonnegut talking, just talking over a beat. Always but, and, wear sunscreen. Yeah. And the, the joke cool. is it was actually written by a uh, columnist for the Chicago Sun Times. It was a woman, but somebody misattributed it to Kurt Vonnegut. And then a dance music producer hired a guy that sounded like Kurt Vonnegut to speak it over a dance beat. Um, that was a hit. But anyway, it was on the radio a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my favorite line from it was uh, I know which one. But they said, say. like, it was the one we're just talking about. They said, like, live in New York, but, but leave before you get too hard. And live in California, but leave before you get too soft. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, that's exactly yeah. what it was. I, I remember yeah. that very much because I'd, I've never moved and lived anywhere except uh, Atlanta and uh, Ohio. Yeah. So I'm always like, should I have tried living in New York? Should I have tried living in L.A.? I wonder. Hmm. It's, it's enough to just get, you don't actually have to live there, but I think it's good to um, experience a bit, you know. You just... I've definitely been to both places. Yeah, so yeah. probably enough. <laughs> probably well, um, you may be tired. It's been a really great conversation. I don't know. Pretty yeah, tired. thanks for this. Yeah, it was sure. fun. Uh, no, uh, no preset structure. Yeah, two guys that love music and love ideas. Right on. Riffing on life. Yeah. Well, thank you for being willing to do this. It's really, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you for a very long time. So I really. Yeah, I feel like we have been talking for a long time. But you're right. It's just like we didn't really have this kind of uh, voice and face connection. So. Yeah. Um, Nice to have a real two way. But uh, yeah, anybody listening to this, you know, if if you listen to the end of this thing, go to my website. Like Adam said, I, I answer my email and I enjoy it, as I said earlier. So yeah, tell I really like it when. What is hmm? that site? Because I didn't give it in the intro. So be sure. you. Oh, S-I-V-E dot R-S. It's just my last name with a dot in it. So S-I-V-E dot R-S or just search the web, you know, but everything is on my website. I don't really do the socials. Um, yeah. I've just got my own website and that's enough for me. I don't need to post on platforms. So go to my website. There's a big link to email me. It goes to my eyes only. I answer everybody. He does. I enjoy it. He does. Um, dude, I got an email yesterday from a guy in Gaza. Um, they grew up in Gaza that is a fan of my work and emailed me. I'm like, oh my God, we got something to talk about. Please, you know, tell me. <laughs> I had so many questions for him. And um, so... Uh, I love, you know, I hear from like a guitar builder in Slovenia and I hear from uh, whatever actors in Beijing. I just, I love my inbox. It's so much fun. Um, so I really like when people introduce themselves and say hello. So, well, that's great. Well, yeah. the next time I send you an email, I'll know that you actually know who I am. And that that's, makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I think I know you by now. That's good. It's been a long time. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. uh, if you ever want to do this again, let me know. We can do this again. Otherwise, it's thanks, Adam. Great. Thanks for having me. You bet. See you later. See ya. <laughs>